Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18. Again, want to just uh, just brag on the Lord. I can't. I, I'm still excited about last week and all that the Lord did for us through that. Amen. Wish wish you'd have been here and seen it. Amen. That's just one of them. You you had to be here to see it. You, you just no telling you how good it went. All right. First Kings eighteen. First Kings eighteen. Uh, so far, we're talking about Elijah again, and so far, uh, we've seen Elijah in his background, just he's a common man, just like any one of us, he, nothing special, nothing stood out about Elijah, he wasn't a, a scholar, he wasn't a brilliant man that went to years and years of uh, a seminary training, he was just a common man. The Lord uses common people. Amen. Amen. He really does. Uh, I've been studying some revivals, and the uh, Great Welch Revival uh, started, and a lot of credit was given to a man who, who was praying, and his prayer was, Lord, use a common man out of the coal mines, use a common man out of the fields, so that you might get the glory. And a lot of times, that's the way the Lord does. He uses common people, and that way he gets the glory. Because uh, men are tempted to, to, to pride. And if it had been some great scholar or someone out of some school, then the pride would have crept in and they'd have tried to take credit. But the fact that it came from a common man, uh, God got all the glory. But we looked at Elijah's background, and then we seen Elijah in the brook. I stayed there at the brook, there at Cherith, and the ravens fed him, and he drank of the water of the brook. Then we seen Elijah in the barrel, the empty barrel meal, and then we talked about Elijah and the boy, how the boy died, and he raised him from the dead. Now today, we're going to look at Elijah and a backslider. Elijah and the backslider. Uh, it'll make more sense when we get into it, but Elijah has learned his lessons well, and God is sending him, he's prepared him, and now he's sending him to face the king yet again. He's going to confront that wicked Ahab yet again. And Elijah, before he meets with King Ahab, he meets up with a man named Obadiah, and uh, we'll read about him in uh, here in just a second. Let's go ahead and look at look at chapter 18, the first part here, and just see what we can learn from it. Uh, verse 1, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself to Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. First thing I want to point out was the command. Uh, uh, not, and it came to pass, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show thyself. It, the command, there's several things I want to point out about that command, when it came in and all that stuff, but uh, look at first the period. After many days, in the third year, so it's been in the third year, it's been over three years of no rain. We go three weeks without rain and we start getting worried. Could you imagine three years? No rain. Oh, it's pretty serious. It's pretty serious. So the period uh, that the Lord spoke to him was after many days and in the third year. The purpose, what, what, was he, what was he calling him for? To go show thyself to Ahab. He said, okay, it's time for you to go meet the king. It's time for you to go talk to him again. You're going to confront that wicked Ahab again. Uh, God's not afraid of man. We're going to see the fear of man show up here in just a little bit. And, uh, but God's not afraid of any man. And God's men, God's people... Shouldn't fear man either. 
Amen. We shouldn't fear man. What can he do? What's the worst? What's the worst thing that someone could do? Send me to heaven? I mean, really? Stop and think about that. Paul said to uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. Amen. Uh, so either either way, if I if I live, I'm gonna live for Christ. If I die, I'm gonna be with Christ. But uh, Daniel was one of those. You shouldn't fear man, especially if you're doing what you should be doing, if you're doing right. You have nothing to fear. And Daniel was one of those men like that. They, 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 uh, Daniel was a good man. He, 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 he was a man of character. And he prayed every day, and his enemies were jealous of him, and they saw the way, tried to find a way to get him in trouble and get him killed, get his position. And they tricked the king into passing a law that you can't pray to anybody but him. You know what Daniel did? He continued to pray just like he always did to the Lord every day. He didn't try to hide it. He opened his windows. Yeah, that's right. He didn't, he didn't go in a closet and try to do it secretly. And, you know, one of them, you know, just... Real quick, thank you Lord for this meal and just so no, hope nobody said No, he didn't care who saw him. He was not ashamed, not ashamed at all. And uh, the Lord blessed him. And then and then there's the prophecy in the command there. He says, I will send rain. So God's going to end the drought. He's going to end the drought. But there's going to be a contest. We're going to see that in a little while. Uh, maybe next week probably. Uh, but I wanted to point out something in verse 2. And Elijah went. Notice the promptness. He didn't, he didn't delay. He didn't start saying, Oh Lord, do I, do I really have to go talk to him? Lord, you know that's a long way to get back there to where he is. You know, Lord, it's hot and it's dry. I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I've got perfect. No. He did exactly as the Lord told him to do when the Lord told him to do it. You know what a lot of problem problem is today? People just won't listen to the Lord. They know what they ought to do. The, the Lord spoke to them through preaching. The Lord spoke to them through Bible reading. They know what they should do, but they just won't do it. Or they delay in doing it. A lot of times the Lord could be trying to move in a service and the Lord tells somebody to give a testimony and they, oh I ain't doing that, I ain't doing that, I ain't doing that. And they just killed the whole service. The Lord might have might have been wanting to do something in that service and, and someone hindered him from doing it. Maybe the Lord's telling somebody to stand up and uh, give a testimony or maybe the Lord's telling somebody to, to sing, amen, or just, just go to the altar or just uh, I believe one of the great revivals, the great awakening was started by a little girl just simply standing up and saying how much she loved the Lord. She just said she loved the Lord. She just stood up and said, I love the Lord. And revival broke out. Why? Because she's just doing what she should do. What she was told to do. Uh, if we do what we was told to do, it probably floor us what God could do with our church. If everybody in here would just do what we're supposed to do. Amen. Amen. Uh, if we be where we're supposed to be, uh, witness when we're supposed to witness, do what we're supposed to do, it probably floor us the difference it would make in our life and our homes. Yes. Amen. Amen. But anyway, there's the command. Secondly, the condition. Uh, at the end of verse 2, it says that there was a sore famine in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land and to all the fountains of water and to all the brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive that we lose not all the beasts. 
So they divided the land between them to pass through it. And Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him, and fell on his face and said, Art thou my Lord, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Now, before we go too much further, I, I want to look at the condition uh, again. It was bad in Israel. Imagine three, three and a half years, no rain. Imagine there's no trees. I mean, I don't know what time of year it was, whether it was spring, when all the flowers normally would bloom, or whether it was fall, when all the beautiful colors should be popping. But it didn't matter. There wasn't nothing but dead trees and dead grass, dead flowers. There was nothing alive and green and beautiful. Everything was dying after three years. It was gone probably. It'd been like a it'd been like a dust bowl. The wind probably just kick up the dust. How I many of you ever seen it so dry that wind would actually stir dust up? It's been dry before, but I've seen, seen it like that. Now, the famine was said, to, in verse 2, was said to be sore. When the Bible says it was sore, you can believe it was severe. It would have been a very severe drought. No water, no food. And it's even to the point that the king, now listen, Ahab was a wicked king. He was a wicked king, no, no question about it. Even the king's animals were in danger of dying. They would have took care of the king and his stuff before they would anybody else's. So it's even, it's even affected the king now. Because the king's out there looking for uh, grass or something to feed his animals. But also you got to notice the faith there in verse 4. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Ahab's, now this is what was going on during the time. We're talk, talking about the condition that, that Israel's in. Ahab's wicked wife Jezebel cut off the prophets. That meant she was killing them. She was killing them. That's how you cut them off. She was, she was killing them. You, you talk about persecution. People talk about persecution. America, we don't know nothing about persecution. We don't. We have, we're clueless as to being persecuted as Christians. Uh, I, I really, we are. They were, there's persecution right there. I've never had to run for my life and hide in a cave. I've never had to depend on someone else to feed me, bring me bread and water, because if I stick my head out, they're going to kill me. Because I'm a Christian, it ain't that bad. Ain't that bad yet. People talk about persecution, they're usually talking about somebody laughed at them. Boy, ain't that going to be something to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, and those that were persecuted for their faith is going to go up there and they're going to be judged and we're going to hear what they went through. And we was afraid to witness somebody, afraid they'd laugh at us. They had their head cut off because they wouldn't stop witnessing, because they wouldn't stop preaching Christ. And we won't even tell our loved ones about the Lord. Well, we're in trouble, ain't we? Amen. The judgment seat of Christ is called the terror of the Lord for a reason. I look forward to going to heaven, but I fear the judgment. Yes, sir. Amen. Because I know how sorry I am. I know how short I fall. I don't even live up to my own expectations sometimes. You say, preacher, uh, don't get all pious on me. You're the same. Flesh is flesh. I don't care whose bones you're hanging on. The only difference is I'll be honest with you. There's some who will sit around like, well, not me. I wouldn't trust you as far as I could throw you. Amen. I that's the kind of people I don't trust at all. 
Right. Amen. Amen. Right. And amen. If you got nothing else, you got a nugget right there. Amen. <laughs> uh, but the fields, look at this in verse 5. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land, and to all the fountains of water, and to all brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save horses, the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they've lost some, but he's not wanting to lose them all. So even the king himself and one of his governors, Obadiah, is out there looking for food for the, to feed them, searching for grass. They're searching in the dry creek beds, the dry ponds, the dry lakes, the last place where water would have pulled in hopes that there might be enough green there to get to feed the animals. That's what they're doing. So everything's dried up, and they've divided the land up. One's going this way searching, and one's going another way searching. Uh, it would have been it would have been bad times there. But uh, also notice the folly. You say, what do you mean the folly? Well, they're wasting time. Ahab's wasting time, and stood out there looking for grass to feed his animals. He's a king over a kingdom of people. And he's worried about the horses and the mules rather than the people who are starving to death, who have starved to death and they've watched their families starve to death and they themselves are dying of starvation. And he's out there worried about his horses and his mules. That'd have been a good typical American right there, wouldn't it? There's people dying and going to hell, and we're worried about our yard. We're worried about washing our car. We're worried about getting our hair cut. We're worried about doing this and doing that. We put everything in front of soul winning. Yes. Everything. Yes. Anything in front of soul winning. Mmm. Yes. Mmm. But Ahab, he should have been trying to get right with God. He knew why there was no rain. Elijah told him in chapter 17. Elijah told him why there was no rain. And Ahab, instead of trying to get right, was letting his wife kill the prophets, kill the Christians, so to speak, kill them while he was out running around trying to take care of his animals. Little concern for people. Yes, that's right. You know what the Lord was concerned about? People. The Lord was concerned. He wasn't concerned about religion. He was concerned about people. The souls of men. Right. Amen. Amen. And that's what matters. Amen. Amen. Your house don't matter. It's going to burn. Your hair, you can get it cut next week. Whatever you see, what I mean, whatever, whatever you put off visitation for, you could have put it off for visitation. But anyway, uh, now we're going to get to the compromiser. Look at verse seven. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, "Art thou that my lord Elijah?" And he answered him, "I am. Go tell thy lord." Behold, Elijah's here. Oh, I like that. I can't help but like that. Uh, did you catch that? I hope you caught that. Elijah, he don't play around. He, he, he just tells him straight up, go tell thy Lord. Yeah. Behold, Elijah's here. And he said, what, have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver my thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. Remember, he's searching for him. He's been trying to find him. Uh, Jezebel's been killing all the prophets probably because they're not telling where Elijah is. They don't know where he is and they can't pray and get it to rain so she's a killing them. All this is going on and when they uh, and he's looking into other nations to, trying to find him. 
And when they don't find him, he makes them swear that he's not there. Makes them take an oath that he ain't there. Almost threaten them. You better hope I don't find him there. You better hope I don't find out he that you're covering up for him. That's kind of what's going on here. And when they said he's not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now sayest thou, go tell thy Lord... Behold, Elijah's here, and it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from thee that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid 150 men of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And now sayest, that, sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah's here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Now, here's the old compromiser. I like to call him the secret service Christian. He's a Christian, but he don't want nobody to know it. He, 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 that's a picture of someone who's ashamed of their salvation. That's a picture of someone who is uh, saved, but they are they fear man more than they fear God. They they they're more concerned with fitting in with the crowd than they are following the Lord. We'll see. It. First thing I want to point out is his position in verse three. We're told that he feared God. But this action, uh, but by his action, we also see that he feared man. He feared man. Uh, and he may have feared the Lord, but it was in the past. It's not right now. We'll deal with that in a second. But his position was he was a high official in Ahab's court. He was right there with the king. He would. He was. He was there when the king by himself with the king. You you hold a pretty high position, and you've got to be trusted pretty well. And his wife is killing Christians, and here's one beside her husband. Ahab don't know he's a believer. I worked with a man. For almost two years, I worked with a man for almost two years. He was a preacher. He never once told me about the Lord. He never once invited me to his church. He never once warned me about hell. I got saved. And as soon as I got saved, I, I'm, I'm telling everybody I got saved. I'm witnessing. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. The very week that I got saved is the first time he shows up in my stall wanting to talk about the Lord. Here he comes in and he's wanting me to come to his church. Somebody else has done the work, now he wants me to go to his church. I asked him, I said, how long have you known I've lost? He said, well, I could tell by your speech. I mean, of course, I mean, I was rough, of course. He said, I could tell by your speech. And I said, you never told me. If it had been up to him, I'd have died and went to hell. Because he'd have never told me. He only wanted to show up when he thought he could get me to go to his church. Put another number on the board. Oh my. That's what we're living in today. But anyway, he was too worried about what everybody there would think if he started trying to witness the lost people where he worked. He was too worried about what the boss men would say and the other people would say. I didn't care what they said. I witnessed all of them after I got saved. Yeah. But uh, anyway, look at his perception in verse 7. 
In verse 7, And Obadiah was in the way, and behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? His perception is clear. He knows who Elijah is. Uh, but I want to point out something. He probably wasn't too excited to see. See, we, we, we read that and we, we, we're thinking, Art thou my, that my Lord Elijah? Like, oh, I'm so glad to see you. No, he's not glad to see him. Because his, his boss, so to speak, his king, is going to kill him if he finds him. And Elijah's getting ready to put him on the spot, too. Elijah's getting ready to send him to go tell him a lot that, that, that Elijah's there. But here's something I found to be true. A person who keeps bad company is not thrilled to see God's people. Let me put it to you this way. Would you introduce me to every single one of your friends? If they, could, if they would talk and act in front of me just like they do in front of you, would you want to introduce them to me? See, sometimes, sometimes uh, people keep questionable company. And then when they see someone from church, they're like, oh, I hope they don't see me with them. You ought not keep questionable company. Right. Amen. Yeah. But anyway, a person who keeps bad company usually is not thrilled to see God's people. Now the problem is in verse 8. And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah's here. Uh, Elijah sees right through him. His problem is he didn't fool Elijah for a minute. Elijah knew who he was from his dress as he's one, of, he's one of Ahab's men. He was part of Ahab's crew. He was, he was answering to Ahab. If he was a Christian, he wouldn't have been answering to the wicked world that was killing the men of God. Yeah, he hid five. I mean, he, he hid 50 uh, in one cave and 50 in another cave and fed them bread and water and all that stuff. Yeah, he, he did that, but if you notice, that was past tense. What's he doing now? He's right there with the king. He's right there trying to help that wicked king. Uh, there's some jobs I won't do. I'll never be a bartender. There's no way you'd get me to serve the devil's drink to people. There's no way. There's no way. I'll starve to death and let my family starve to death before I did that. You said, preacher, that's awful, that's terrible. You can do it if you want to. I'm telling you, me, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have no part in it. Why? I read the book. Amen? Yeah. Yep. But, uh, but here, Obadiah don't have any problem working for a king and being high up in his office. Now listen, you, you run for those. You have to work to get there. You have to want that position. They don't just come and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you're doing this. You, you, you try to work and earn and show your loyalty and your trustworthiness to the king and to his program and to his beliefs before you get that high up to where you can be that close to the king. So here's a worldly Christian. Mm, a compromiser. Now, he, he, now listen to his protest. Elijah said, go tell, go tell thy Lord. Thy Lord. Who did he call his Lord? Ahab. Yep. Not Jehovah. Not, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, go tell thy Lord, talking about Ahab. So we know who Obadiah serves. Now, his protest is verse 9. And he said, what, have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? And as the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they say he's not there... He took an oath of the king 
kingdom and nation that they found thee not. Now, he, there's three basic protests that he has. First is disrespect. He probably feels disrespected by the man of God here. He probably feels like the man of God disrespected him. Here I was trying to be nice to him and, and he talked to me like that. He, he, he uses that terminology. He, he, he didn't even ask me nicely. Yeah, I've had people get mad at me just because the way I preach sometimes. Well, preacher, you don't have to, the way you word stuff, the way you word stuff, you can word it differently. Yeah, I can word it differently. And it wouldn't have the same effect. It got you mad enough to come talk to me. So I know you got it. <laughs> Amen. You understood it. That's the problem. When you make it plain and simple, people don't like it sometimes. But but he, he just got right to the point to go tell thy Lord. And what have I sinned? Why are you talking to me this way? I can imagine his feelings was hurt. But also, one of his protests was danger. Look at verse 10. As, I, as the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom. We've done read that. And he, what he's afraid of is... He's afraid that the king's going to kill him. He's afraid that he's going to go tell the king, hey, I found Elijah. Come, I'll show you where he is. And then when he goes, Elijah's not going to be there. And it's going to make him look like a liar. So he's afraid of the danger of dying, and he's also afraid of being defamed. So the king trusts me. I don't want him to think bad of me. I don't want him to think that I'm, I, 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 I'm not loyal to him. I don't want him to think that I deceived him. You know, some people are more worried about what the wicked world thinks of them than what God thinks of them. Some people are more worried about what your friends will say about you than you are the fact they're lost and going to hell. That's something to think about. If you don't witness to them, who is? If you don't win them, who will? Well, I pray the Lord send somebody. Yeah, he has. You. It's your friend. He saved you and he put you in their life or, they put, or he put them in your life that you might be the witness. Mm. But here's, here, here's, here's something else. It's almost like he's saying the cost is too high. The king will kill me, and there's no way I'm going to go to do that. Now, ain't that a far cry from what Elijah did? The spirit told Elijah what to do, and he, he did it. Now Elijah's telling Obadiah what to do and he's making all excuses as to why he shouldn't. As to why he shouldn't or why he can't or why it's crazy or why it's absurd. Elijah didn't ask him if it made sense would you go tell him. If you feel like it, go tell him. He said, go tell him. Hmm. Look at his pride. We're going to look at that. Verse 13. Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Now, stop and think about this. He's telling Elijah what a great thing he did. He's telling Elijah what a great man of God he is. He's telling Elijah, Obadiah is, bragging on himself and his achievements to Elijah, the one who stopped the rain for three and a half years, the one who raised a dead boy that had never been done before back to life. He's telling have you not heard what I did? Wow. I'm really impressed. Go tell Ahab I said. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, stop and think about that. But I, there's a there's a lesson here. There's a lesson here. People that backslide like to brag on what they what they have accomplished. They can't talk about what they're doing because they're doing nothing now. But they like to brag about 20 years ago, I used to do this. 20 years ago, I won somebody to the Lord. 20 years ago, I taught a Sunday school class. 20 years ago, I used to sing in the choir. So they like talking about what they used to do. We got a lot of used to do Christians today. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. But uh, anyway, let's keep going here. Notice his persuasion. In verses 15 and 16, Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, I promise, cross my heart, hope to die, I'll be here when you get back. You see it? He, he, he almost had to cross his heart and hope to die in front of him to get him to do what the Lord told him to do. The accusation that now, uh, what persuaded him, what pers excuse me, what persuaded him was Elijah basically telling him, I'm not going to go anywhere. I will be here. He had to promise him, so to speak, make it oath or whatever to him that he'd be there. Now the confrontation, just to, just briefly, i uh, just got a few minutes left here, the confrontations in verse 17 and 18. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and has and has followed Balaam. Now the accusation is what we hear all the time. It's God's people's fault. Seen on the news. It. Uh, I don't know. If you may have seen it this week. Seen on the news. A lot of this critical race theory and this uh, transgender uh, pronouns. He, him, her. It, she, uh, it, them, what, whatever. This is just stupidity stuff. Finally, some, some parents are standing up and saying, I don't want that to talk to my kids in school. I, I, I don't want my kids being taught that in school. And some woman got up there who was uh, some liberal leftist who was all for the queers and the transgender and uh, perverting our kids' minds, got up there and said something about, all the hatreds dripping off these Jesus believers. See, they blame us when there's a problem in society, but we're not the ones who's trying to change society. They're the ones trying to pervert the children. They're the ones trying to get the teacher to lie to a little boy or girl. If a little boy comes to me and tells me, I'm a her, I would say, you're lying. You're wrong. Amen. That's the truth. Yeah. To go along with that lie is, is worse for the kid. But that's what they want you to do today. That's what you want. They, that, that's, that's the result of letting, letting little, little Joey play with uh, Barbie too long. Amen. Little boys shouldn't be playing with baby dolls. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. I like what I heard somebody say one time. They said, yep. I don't know what it is with this thin-skinned sissy society we're in today. I really don't. I really don't. Now, this is me again. I, I'm going to tell you what they said in a second. Uh, they didn't used to... They didn't used to swaddle us and, and pamper us and... And, and, and baby protect everything like they do now. Growing up, I got to play with guns, knives, and fireworks. The dumb ones didn't make it. <laughs> Amen? Now everything's child-proof and kid-proof and padded, and all the dumb ones are making it. 
That's what's wrong with society, ain't it? <laughs> but anyway, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep going. I'm out of time. But the accusation, the world always accuses the people. But the truth of the matter is, it's not us. I had, I had a preacher from another church one time come to me and uh, was talking to me. I'd witnessed to somebody that happened to be in their church about the King James Bible, and he was upset. Well, set me straight. He said, "You King James Bible." Believers, you King James only Bible believers are dividing the body of Christ. I said, no, we're not. I said, I've heard that argument before. The King James Bible was here before those other versions you're trying to shove down our throat. Y'all are the one dividing the body of Christ, not us. But anyway, the accusation, but the answer, the answer uh, that he gave them was, no, it's not us. It's not me. It's you. And that's the truth of it. The problem today is not with the people who follow the Lord. It's those that's trying to follow the devil and get others to follow him. That's where the problem lies. Those that's trying to get the society to do evil and wicked, to do wrong, to reject God. That's the ones you got to worry about. But anyway, I'm out of time, dead on time. Any questions or comments? But the way society is today is because of the Christian not doing their job in getting folks saved, you see. Yep. Peter says judgment begins in the house of God until we judge ourselves from not doing what the Lord said to do. Society will continue to slide into sin worse and worse. I'm studying the effects of uh, kicking God out of school and how from in the early 60s that happened, then in the late 60s you have an event over in California that, that stirred the, the GBTLHIQ, HIV, whatever that is, that, that mess got stirred in 69. Just a few years after we kicked God out of school. A few years after we kicked the Bible and prayer out, the queers come out of the closet. I showed you in Roman 1, a result, the, the homosexuality is a result of God stepping back and letting man have his way. God's hand is coming off of America and it's evident by the rise of homosexuality, the transgender, Wanting men in the girls' bathroom, wanting you to call the little boys little girls and the little girls little boys, and all this foolishness that's going on today. In the 50s, they'd have locked some of these people up and put them in a padded room and told them they was crazy mm -hmm. and wouldn't let them loose in society. They were a danger. But now they're the ones running the country. Right. Yeah. Why? Because God's pulling his hand off. You don't want me? Okay. That's a fearful thing. That's a fearful thing. But anyway, uh, go ahead, brother.